Uh, I just walked out and the photographer said that's not Kirby, so thanks for the validation there, gentlemen. Um, and it wasn't with excitement. So next up, Kirby Smart. Kirby is the defending national championship coach, obviously. He's a two-time SEC coach of the year. Uh, Kirby and I post-game in Indianapolis had an interaction and we had two teams, so you want to be respectful. We have a victorious team and a losing team. Really energetic post-game celebration. Uh, I've never seen a head coach jumping up, running at people and chest bumping as much as Kirby did after that, that victory. And he started to do the same with me and I looked at him and said, if you do that to me, you'll probably knock me down and hurt me. So we just had a handshake moment. Uh, during that weekend in Indianapolis, his family was a part of all that happened around the game. Uh, the college football playoff has a foundation, supports a program called Extra Yard for Teachers. There's a 5K held every year around the college football playoff. I ran this year in the freezing cold, along with Kirby's wife, Mary Beth, and his oldest son, Weston. Fun to see their family experiencing the full scope of the national championship events. Uh, Georgia's played in the national championship game twice in the past six years, the other being here in Atlanta as a player. Uh, he led the SEC in interceptions in 1998 uh, with 13 career interceptions. He still ranks sixth in the school's record book. When he's not coaching, as I referenced, he's a father, uh, highly competitive in pickleball. I'll let you ask him about that. And since I made a Netflix reference yesterday, he and Mary Beth enjoy Netflix. They're fans of Ozark and currently with their children watching the show called Stranger Things. So it's my privilege to introduce the coach of the defending national champion, Georgia Bulldogs, Kirby Smart. Well, sounds like my wife has given all the secrets away there. I wonder why she asked me the other day if uh, me talking about her talking about pickleball was okay. So she obviously uh, had gotten requests from Greg. But thanks, Greg. I appreciate all you do for our conference, uh, our game. Uh, he works tirelessly uh, alongside of our presidents. And uh, I'm very fortunate at University of Georgia to have one of the best presidents in the business. Uh, President Moorhead is the member or leader of so many committees. I can't even remember all the names of them, but he does a tremendous job trying to make sure that uh, our game is safe and that things are headed in the right direction. And I appreciate what he does for us. Um, I want to go reverse order today. So I usually thank you guys at the end. I would be remiss if I did not thank you guys for the incredible coverage you give us. And this conference is second to none. You know, I've been in other conferences. I've worked in other conferences. This is my 24th year being involved in the SEC, and it literally is the best there is. And you guys make it that way. So I really appreciate what all you guys do. Um, I also want to take a chance or take an opportunity to give a shout out for the, the 50th anniversary of Title IX. You know, I got a wife at home that played college basketball. That wouldn't have been possible without Title IX and also am a uh, girl dad. My, my daughter Julia is an athlete and runs cross country, plays basketball. And, you know, I want to thank the people and the leaders in the SEC who have promoted women's sports for a long time. And our women's sports programs in the SEC are incredible. Most competitive there is in, uh, of any conference there is out there in all sports. So I love uh, being able to honor that anniversary as well. I'd also be remiss if I didn't talk about our opening game. You know, the Chick-fil-A, uh, kickoff game for us. We get to open against Oregon. I get to go against uh, a longtime friend and, and a guy that meant so much to our program in, in Dan Lanning. But we open against Oregon right here in Atlanta, and uh, we're excited for that opportunity. We get a chance to represent the SEC uh, right off the jump. So our players are excited about that, and so am I. I'm also going to go reverse order and talk about the players that we have here today. When usually I end with that, but you know we got a special group here. I think anybody would be proud of the players they bring. That's why you bring them. But this group is is really special to me. Um, Stetson Bennett. We all know his story. I think you guys, if you ever wanted to do a documentary. This guy's been through it. When you look at what he's done and what all he's been able to do, he's going to graduate this fall in economics. Uh, 
You know, he's from, I like to kid him because people think he's from Blackshear. He's actually from Nahuna. So if you want to do some research, go look up where Nahuna is. And he was a transplant uh, to Blackshear from Nahuna down in South Georgia and certainly a great family. And he's going to graduate in the fall, like I said. Nolan Smith is now a math major and uh, he'll be soon to graduate. He's come back for his senior year. What an incredible personality he has. Uh, he's, he's one of these players that pushes our team. Uh, I tell the story all the time uh, about our players working out and as strength coaches and, and, and leaders in our organization, uh, we don't like for our players to bend over. We feel like it shows weakness if you bend over during your runs. And uh, Nolan was screaming so loud one day at our players. I had my young 10-year-old out there, Andrew, and he was trying to keep up with the players running 40s. And Nolan screamed and yelled about being bent over. And I was looking at Andrew, my son. He was bent over, and he popped up real fast. So when Nolan screams at you, you wake up quick. And uh, he demands a lot of respect uh, in our program because of the way he works. And he's from Savannah, Georgia. And then the third guy we were able to bring was Cedric Van Pran, who's been our, seat, our center, our kind of our caller of fronts. Uh, he was a tremendous guy to recruit. He does everything the right way. Um, you know, he's from New Orleans, he's a communications major, and uh, one of our guys that we think is, is a leader on our team and a part of an offensive line unit that's got a lot of guys returning. So I'm excited about those three players. I hope you'll spend time, talk with them, visit with them, and just get to have a good time with them. One other quick story I wanted to share with uh, about Nolan. You know, he's kind of the jokester on the team, so he likes to crack jokes and do things. And around December 23rd of last year, we were preparing for Michigan and the playoff run, and, and we had a team Christmas party, and we had a team meeting before it. And uh, I was up in front of the team. Everybody was there. We had a little roll call check. We were checking the seats. Nolan wasn't there. He comes running in, and he had a box in his hand. He said, Coach, Coach, the team bought you a Christmas present. Well, it was just for men. It's hair coloring to help out with these grays that I got going on here. And, of course, I thought it was hilarious. He thought it was hilarious. He keeps everything loose for the guys. But I didn't make him run but about 30 sprints for that. So um, he's a fun guy to be around. Needless to say, you guys will spend time with him today. Um, you know, we started this thing off last year with the quote, success comes to those who are too busy to be looking for it. Well, we embraced that last year, and guess what? That doesn't change. So for our team, it's embedded in what we do. You know, we didn't build this program on uh, hoping for one-year wonders or hoping for one opportunity. We built the program to be sustained, and you sustain it by what you do every single day. And this program was built to be here for a long time, and we have an unbelievable footprint with which we get to recruit. So the five-hour radius of Athens, Georgia, gives us a chance to be around some of the best football student athletes there are in the country. So we'll continue to recruit those, develop those, also going nationally. But the team that we have coming back, I, I, I've been around, done the rounds this morning. I'll bet you at least 50 people have asked me the question. So feel free when we open up for questions to ask me the concern there is for complacency. That does not concern me in the least, because to be complacent, you have to have done something and achieved something. The men on this team for this season have not done that. They have not. We had 15 players that are now gone to NFL uh, camps or draft picks. They're gone. And we have some returning players, but they're hungry as ever. People have asked the question, how does it feel to be hunted? We will not be hunted at the University of Georgia. I can promise you that. The hunting that we do will be done from us going the other direction. Um, it's not something we're going to sit back and be passive about. Our guys have asked questions, and we've done a lot of studies on how the mighty have fallen. So we, we have skull sessions. We have 15-minute uh, meetings, 20-minute meetings in breakout groups, and we've actually taught how the mighty have fallen. I'm talking about in business. I'm talking about in sports. I'm talking about in history. So you learn from the mistakes of others, and for us, it really steers down to one one cultural belief that we have a connection that's greater than our opponent. We're all going to be tough. We're all going to be physical in the SEC. But can we be better connected together? Can we have one plus one equals three? Because for us, one plus one equals three means we get more together than we do apart. And this team believes that. I'm excited about this team because there's a lot of opportunity. People say, do you have the talent? Do you have enough talent within your program? We've got plenty of talent. What we lack right now is experience. 
That's our job as coaches to put those guys in a position to be successful and react in a calm manner and have the experience they need to go play well against Oregon. That game will help set us up for our SEC gauntlet that we have coming up after that. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. All right, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Allie, Lexi, and Blake will get a microphone to you. And so we'll start right here on the front aisle. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, Coach. Good morning. Donnell Suggs, Atlanta Business Chronicle. Just wanted to ask you, what did you learn during the title run that can help you all this upcoming season? Well, I think the biggest thing is time management for us during that time. You know, we, we, we probably did more work in that championship run than we did in previous years. So the previous playoff we had, we didn't practice as many days in pads. We didn't condition as much as we did in this one. We felt like that was a very uh, integral part to our team is could we be the best conditioned team when we played Michigan? Could we be the best conditioned team when we played Alabama? And that was something that we really honed in on and thought was important. And our, our players bought into it you know you can't go in a room and say hey guys we're going to run extra after practice and they're going to feel good about it they got to believe it so we had a, a small group that felt like that was important and they did it and that was probably the one thing pushing the guys at the end of the year more than we usually do coach we'll go over here to our left second row okay. coach uh, you said after the Lance McCurley of Oconee News you said after the spring game that this team needed to find its own identity and with fall camp just around the corner, do you have any indication of what this team's identity might be heading into this upcoming season? Yeah, hungry. I talked about it earlier. I mean, there's, there's a hunger among this group that uh, they, a lot of guys want to prove that they can replace the other guy. And uh, they don't want to be the other guy. They want to be the next guy. And you look across the board, we had some really high-profile players really on defense and offense when you count the backs and the receivers that we, we have to replace those guys. And the hunger comes from the opportunity the talented players behind them have. And I'm, I'm excited. That's why complacency is something that happens to people that don't look what's, they don't look what's going on. We, we, don't, we don't have that problem. There's not a day that we don't wake up and think, what can we do better to make our program better? And our players are doing that right now. Okay, we're going to go over here on the right side on the far aisle. Steve. Hey, Coach. Uh, Steve Moulton, WZZN from Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I notice uh, second game of the year you're playing Sanford and Coach Hatcher as well. If you could talk about uh, your experiences at Valdosta State in the Gulf South Conference and kind of coming full circle, if you will, in game two. Well, how long you got? Because I could tell you about a 20-hour bus ride I took to uh, Arkadelphia. I could tell you about Texarkana. Uh, I can tell you about uh, all the different places I went in Mississippi that I didn't know existed. Um, but it's where I cut my teeth as a coach. And there were some really long bus rides. Uh, we built our own lockers. Uh, I was hired for $5,000. And he later promoted me to 10000 after I did academics and uh, did a salary cap on Division II, which you work off equivalencies. You don't have full rides. I learned a lot while I worked at Valdosta State. And you only learn trial by fire. And I certainly appreciate Coach Hatcher for giving me that opportunity. He's at Sanford, which is my father's alma mater. And my dad played at Sanford and was a college football player there. So it's always unique when we get to play Sanford because my dad gets to pull for his old school. And uh, Hatcher's a good friend, and he's done a tremendous job. Coach, we're going to go right in front of you on this near aisle. Johnny. Good morning, uh, Coach. Johnny Ballpark Franks with Franks Media in Nashville and Huntsville. You alluded to this earlier. You've been a part of national championship programs with Georgia and Alabama. I'm curious, you've also seen the other side of that coin. What's the biggest differences and similarities in the offseason and being able to manage expectations as you prepare for an upcoming season? I think they're all different. You know, I go back to my first year at LSU. People don't realize they were coming off a national title. I was not part of that. But we had a tremendous team coming back, like uber talented, a lot of draft picks. That was probably one of the toughest uh, jobs that's ever – because you had complacency. You had guys that were going to be first-round picks no matter how they played off of how they played the year they won the national championship. And then you fast forward through the four that uh, were able to win in Alabama. It's, it, it, you have experience. Right now, our staff at Georgia, I have a tremendous staff, probably the best staff I've ever had since I've been there in terms of continuity. Okay, we had four coaches change, but the four new coaches we've, we've gotten have really jumped on board, grabbed things. 
they know how to manage this situation. We've got three or four coaches who've done this before in terms of having won a championship and understanding what it takes to do it again. And it's really every situation is different because I've been on teams that had a lot of talent coming back, and I've had a lot of, a lot of them that had to replace talent. This We're having to replace a lot of really good football players. Great news is we've recruited well. We've got good football players. We need experience. But what I love about it is complacency is not the concern. Experience is the concern. And our kids will buy into that, and we'll get them ready in fall camp. Coach, we'll go over here to our left and third row. Coach Ben Portnoy from the state newspaper in Columbia. You've obviously known Will Muschamp for a long time. I guess just what does he bring as a co-defensive coordinator this year, and I guess how has he kind of added to the program since you all brought him on board last year? Yeah, Will's been a tremendous asset for me as a head coach because you value people who have been in your seat. So Todd Muffin's been a head coach. You know, Matt Luke was that way for us as well. He'd been a head coach. Mel Tucker had been in a lot of roles before he left us. So I value that experience he's had in understanding uh, the do's and don'ts, things, ways to do things, how to practice, how you run your organization. And also, it gives you ability to delegate, too. You've got to take some things off your hand. I can focus my attention in other areas if I know he's in charge of something because he's done it. And he's... He's, he's been unbelievable. He's a great staff guy. He's, he's, he's super positive with our players. Players enjoy and love being around uh, Coach Muschamp. And I'm just very thankful that he and his family um, are on our staff and with our program. Coach, we're going to go over to our right in the middle. Here we go. I'll just go right here on the middle line. Coach John Bednarowski, Marietta Daily Journal. Eric Gilbert seemed to have a lot of positive momentum going through the spring. How has the rest of his offseason gone, and what do you expect from him in the fall? Well, I expect him to give us a, an A effort every day. And when you give an A-grade effort and you get the talent that he has, it's a great combination. You know, he's a tremendous athlete. Uh, he's, he's had to do some extra conditioning. Um, he was a little heavy for the spring, and he's worked really hard on bringing that down. He had a really good year academically, which was a, a big hurdle. He had to focus on his academics upon coming to us from LSU, and we, we expect him to do that. He got a great opportunity this spring. You know, people forget Darnell and, and, and Brock were both out. So the opportunity he got, he sees that opportunity to grow and develop. He will have to continue to do that um, to be a major contributor for us. And uh, he's bought into doing that and being a team player. There's a lot more to being a tight end than just catching the ball, and he's bought into that. Coach, we're going to go here in front of me about midway back. Go ahead. Good morning, Coach. DJ Jones, Sports Visions in Columbus. Mikael Williams out of Columbus, Georgia, the reports are that uh, he's going to be able to help you, and he's only been on campus a few months. Can you talk about uh, his development and uh, what stands out about him? Yeah, the number one thing that stands out about Mikael is his work ethic. You never hear anything about him academically. I look out my window, and I see him out there doing extra after every practice. Uh, I left work the other day on a, on a Sunday, and he's out there hitting a sled on Sunday. So, guys, when you got a freshman that's out there on Sunday on his own, on turf, 115 degrees out there, and he's out there striking a sled, something special. And he's talented. Uh, I'm excited for him. I, I, I can't say what his role is going to be right now because I don't know fully what, which way we'll use him, where we'll play him. But he's a great athlete. He's a great young man. He comes from a great family and a great program. Allie, if you'll step up a few rows, we're going to go to Mike Griffith on the aisle. Yeah, Mike Griffith from AJC Dog Nation. So Lane Kiffin told us how much you enjoy talking about Alabama and Nick Saban when you come here. So I want to ask you about object constancy, if you've ever heard that word, number one. And number two, I guess it was a few years ago, you said, if it ain't broke, find a way to make it better. Are there some things that you're looking at at Georgia coming off a national title season, maybe not broke, that you plan to make better? Yeah, we, we do a kind of intrusive look every year at what we can do, how did we do, how did we do in red area, how did we do in uh, turnovers, what are we doing wrong, H how are other people doing it better? So, Mike, I think you know every college coach that's worth a dime, he's going to go talk to other coaches and figure out a better way. Um, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to Coach Munkin and Coach Schumann. Both those two guys, they love getting on Zoom. They love talking to NFL uh, coaches and figuring out a new way to do it. How deep do you play your safety? How do you run your mesh route? What's something new you're doing on the inside zone? We're constantly looking to get better, and our staff does a lot of projects. We've got a lot of uh, quality control analyst guys that bring a lot of information to our staff and have made us a better program. So, yeah, we're constantly looking at getting better. But at the end of the day, it's how do you use your players best? 
You know, who, who utilizes James Cook or Brock Bowers or who utilizes a guy like Channing Tindall as a third linebacker? How are you using the skill set of your players? And that's what players want. At the end of the day, players want to say, how are you going to utilize my skill set? What package can you take me as a rusher, me as a run stopper, me as a pass catcher, and utilize that skill set? And that's what we spend our time on. Okay, we're going to go right down the center aisle again. Hey, Coach. Chris Marler, Saturday on South. First off, congrats. Uh, bear with me here because my family is all Alabama fans, so I'm going to relive this moment. You get to the national championship game. Stetson Bennett has been like the scapegoat, it seems like, for almost two years as the quarterback. Uh, you're down one in the fourth quarter. Up until that point, he had thrown five interceptions in the two games against Bama. He, he had, it was like two of five for like 14 yards in the second half. You still go back to the well, and he goes three for three, drives right down the field, has the game-winning drive. What kind of sense of like personal victory did that feel like for you, trusting your own instincts as somebody that had been questioned so many times before in games against Bama? You know, I don't, I don't know that it was any personal vindication. I, it's, it's what you do as a coach. I, I go off how we practice, you know, what guys show us in practice. I'd seen Stetson Bennett make those plays repeatedly in practice. And, um, you know, the conversation with Coach Munkin was to be aggressive and, and go play to win the game. You know, you're not going to hide behind your quarterback and win a national championship. you got to go let him play. And uh, I thought Coach Munkin and the offensive staff did an unbelievable job bouncing back. And, you know, really unfortunate in a lot of those opportunities early in the game. It wasn't a matter of Stetson playing poorly. It was self-inflicted wounds. And it wasn't a matter of, I mean, we, we started inside the five. We started, we had the penalty. We averaged second down was over 10 yards. I mean, you're not going to win games doing that. And a lot of it was what we did. So when we control what we do and we do the right way, Stetson can be a uh, major factor. And look, Stetson's one of the, the least respected good players there is in this country. And guess what? We get to see it every day. The kid's a tremendous athlete. He's got a good arm strength. People just keep doubting him, and that's fine with me. Coach, we'll go over here on the left-hand side along the aisle. Uh, good morning, Coach. Michael Giddens, The War Report, Auburn. Uh, you mentioned in your opening statement that you feel good about the state of development at the University of Georgia. Stetson Bennett didn't start the season uh, as your starter, but he finished the national champion. Uh, given the state of development, how do you feel about the pipeline behind him? And have you guys identified a, a guy this spring? Has anybody stood out to step in in, uh, in case you need him at quarterback next year? Yeah, I, th I don't think you, if you're a good coach, you don't go into the season without thinking you've got two or three guys that can come in and play, especially in our conference. You're going to get hit. You're going to get tackled. You're going to get knocked back, and he's going to probably have to run the ball some. So that puts him at risk of injury. And our quarterback room right now I'm extremely confident in. You know, Carson Beck's been in the program, done a lot of good things. He was a guy that we – he won a state championship in high school, did a tremendous job. Brock Vandergriff is a tremendous athlete who has got a tremendous upside. He's gotten better and better. Those two guys are growing rapidly because of the number of reps they're getting. And then Gunnar Stockton spent the spring with us, who's a good athlete we're excited about. So I feel really confident about our quarterback room, confident because I have Stetson returning, but confident because we have competent, well-coached backups as well. Okay, we're going to go right down in front of me, Coach, third row. Uh, Coach Drew DeArmond, WZZN Radio, Huntsville, Alabama. I know you worked with him extensively at the University of Alabama, and then two years ago you brought Scott Cochran with you. You guys had a very close personal relationship. I know he had to take a step away from your program. He tweeted something out personally on July the 4th about uh, meaning even more than the national championship rings he's won at Alabama and Georgia and being one year sober. What does he mean to your program, and what did, how did you guys support him to help him come back and now be a big part of your program? Well, we we commit to having conversations and the commitment to Scott was that he's committed to our program and getting better and you look at what he's done with our players I, I don't think you'd find we got a lot of exceptional people in our organization Jonas Jennings, Brian Gant, uh, Scott Sinclair I could go on forever but Scott Cochran spends a tremendous amount of time with our players on a personal level and they value the relationship that he creates with them. He spends time with them, meaningful time with them. And I think a lot of our players saw the human side with Scott and that we all know addiction is real. And it probably affected me as the leader of the organization for the first time to have someone on your staff be involved with that. And I got a lot of help from outside sources on how to do it. And I'm so proud of what he's done and how he's fought back to bring himself back and be the husband and father 
that he's always been. And he's a tremendous husband and father, and that's first. And he's a mentor to the players on our team. And, you know, he's got tons of players that played at Alabama that still reach out to him and talk to him. They come and work out at our place and come see him because they value that relationship that he had with them. And he's a special person that's meant a lot to a lot of people. So we've stood there by him and supported him, and we'll continue to do that. Coach, we'll go over here on the left side again on the far aisle. Yeah, it's Coach uh, David Friedlander with the Gwinnett Daily Post. Uh, circle back to, to Stetson. Uh, you mentioned about how he, you, you think he's uh, one of the least respected good players. Looking, though, more as a leader, though, uh, can you speak to what differences, if any, that you see, as a, see in him as a leader now as opposed to when he first stepped into the starting job? Yeah, I think now he has uh, a little more, what's the right word, uh, support because he is the guy. You know, it's hard for players around you to have conviction you're the guy if you're not the starter. And he wasn't the starter at this time last year, at this time two years ago. Um, he started intermittently throughout two years ago. And then once he won the job, I think he's created a little bit of momentum with our players, our skill players, because there's not a doubt there. You know, they understand he knows the system. He can get them the ball. He can throw the ball vertically down the field. He can throw deep comebacks. He can scramble around and make a play with his feet. And I think they value that. That's given him a little more credibility, which credibility to me is earned. Right. He earned that by the way he played at the end of the year and most of the season. And he continues to do that the way he leads out there in seven on sevens and practices and things. All right, we have time for three more. We'll start here in the front row right in front of me, coach. First row. Hi, um, Anna Ruth Riggins with Dog Post. So earlier, Nolan Smith described the defense as the oldest brothers of the group. So what do you expect from this defense this season and moving forward? Uh, my expectation for our defense is to be fast and physical. Look, we, we, we don't shy away from the fact that, that we've had success on defense. And I, I, can't, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to recruit a kid and they said, well, they told us y'all weren't going to be any good on defense this year. You're losing everybody. They said that two years ago. They said that last year. They're saying that this year. Look. If you go recruit really good football players and they're fast and physical, you'll play good defense. I mean, you'll play good defense. And good defense sometimes is a, a, a loose term in college football right now because uh, giving up 20 sometimes is a good, good defense. And uh, we don't like to change our standards, and we know we're going to have a good defense year in and year out. It's just going to be different. We're going to have different strengths and different weaknesses, but no one will certainly be a big part of that. Okay, we'll go over here to the right, third row. Kirby Wilson Alexander from The Advocate. When it comes to NIL, how does your program approach it? And is there anything that you think needs to change about how it's structured in college football? Yeah, the, the, the pivotal question, right? Everybody waits for that one for all the conversation. But, you know, the NIL program we have in place, we have a Classic City Collective run by Matt Hibbs who does a tremendous job. It's built on being sustainable because I don't think what's going on in college football right now at some places is sustainable, meaning can you do that year in and year out and repeat that? Can you honor the commitment that some people are trying to make to kids to get them to go to their school? It's just, it's, it's not good for college football what's out there. What is good is NIL is good on the basis of what NIL is based on, okay? For Dan Jackson to be a walk-on from Gainesville, Georgia and come in and get an opportunity to earn money for his education, that is good. For a young man that has a father that's on dialysis down in South Georgia and he can't support his father unless he goes back home and works or he gets NIL, that is good. We have 95 players right now with NIL deals that are on our roster. That's incredible, the depth of that. There's so much good there. It's the guardrails. It's the parameters that we need to protect our game. And not only protect our game, guys, it's protect young men. Okay, because for, you know, a young man, to, uh, we, we may have had the, the highest paid defensive lineman last year in NIL in Jordan Davis. We have the highest paid uh, tight end in Brock Bowers in terms of NIL. Keely Ringo, I would argue, is probably one of the highest paid uh, corners there is in NIL. So NIL can be a good thing and they can learn to manage money at a young age. But to use it as inducement to get a young man to go to your school is not good for anybody or the game. I don't have the answer for how to guardrail that. But NIL has been good to Georgia, and it's been good to our players, and it'll continue to be. Coach, we'll take one final question right in front of me, three rows back. 
Morning, Coach. Kobe Serena with Bulldog Illustrated. With your tight end room being all the rave right now, I just wanted to ask how you think the new blocking rule will affect tight end play at Georgia? It shouldn't affect us. The, the new blocking rule, which was a part of the committee that put that in place, you know, we're not a big team that, that cuts and, and blocks that way. Uh, so it's a safety issue, and we like to block man-to-man, uh, -man, face up. We're not a big cut team, and we don't rely on the cut block, and so it shouldn't change a lot for us. Coach, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, guys. Appreciate what you do.